Welcome to note set number 30 where we'll talk about IIR filters um, and if you remember those are the same as recursive filters and in the last video uh, we talked about FIR filters which are the same as non-recursive filters. So for um, recursive filters um, uh, if you remember those are the ones that have uh, feedback terms um, so we can see that uh, those feedback terms down here <clears throat> in our block diagram. Now um, there's two reasons that IIR filters may not be chosen uh, for uh, use in a particular application. So the, the, the key one is that they do not have linear phase. Um, and if you remember from the last video lecture, um, FIR filters don't have to have linear phase, but they can be made to have linear phase, and all the main design methods uh, are set up to ensure that your design comes out with linear phase. Um, and if you may also remember me saying that uh, in certain areas like digital communications and radar, um, things that involve pulses uh, and filtering of images. We haven't really talked about applying filters to two-dimensional signals like images, but you can. Uh, and uh, so images which involve edges can also um, uh, uh, be strongly uh, required to have um, linear phase when you filter them. Uh, so IIR filters um, do not have linear phase, but you can get approximate linear phase with some special designs, but um, those are not uh, that common really. And then the second issue we, we mentioned a while back is that because IIR filters um, can have poles that are not at the origin, um, those poles could end up being outside the unit circle and therefore causing the filter to be non-stable. Uh, so we would not want a design that is non-stable. So when we're designing IIR filters, we have to pay special attention that our final design ends up being a stable system. Um, but the one advantage that they do have over FIR filters is that um, you can get a very good magnitude response, um, but without the high computational complexity that you might need um, from an FIR filter to get that same kind of magnitude response. Um, so with with uh, IIR filters you might be able to get quite a good uh, filter for a low order, maybe something on the order of 10 or so, uh, versus FIR filters we were seeing hundreds of, of um, coefficients uh, in the feed forward. Um, so the computational complexity for FIR filters can be quite significantly larger. Uh, so just to give you an idea, here's a couple designs. Uh, the top one is an order 7 uh, elliptical IIR design, and we'll, we'll see where that elliptical comes from um, in, in just a little while. We'll, we'll, in the next few slides, we'll be looking at uh, types of, of IIR designs. Uh, and then the bottom one is a FIR design, order 54, uh, designed using FERPM. Uh, again, uh, I mean, we could get a better design, but we would need lo even longer. Um, so I chose these two because their uh, magnitude performance is pretty close to being the same. Um, but we can see that the IIR is only going to need 15 multiplies and 13 additions, whereas the FIR would need 55 multiplies and 54 additions. Uh, so we need almost four times the computation uh, for the FIR filter. So that could be significant in some applications. So we're just going to briefly talk about uh, four easy commands uh, that MATLAB has for, for um, FIR, I'm sorry, IIR design. Um, these are not the only ones, but these are four of the more common ones. Uh, so the, the first one is uh, a way of designing what's called a Chebyshev um, IIR. Uh, the name Chebyshev or Chebyshev, um, it's spelled um, a couple different ways, um, a, Ru a Russian uh, mathematician, uh, so converting from the Russian uh, alphabet to English alphabet 
uh, ends up with various spellings depending on how you do it. Anyway, uh, there are two commands, Chebby1 and Chebby2, and here I'm showing uh, the use of Chebby2. Um, and uh, we're designing a, uh, an order 7. Uh, we can set the stop band height and we can set the stop band edge. And when we do this, um, these are the, the, the results of that, um, the, <clears throat> the B and the A. And you can see that we do get an order 7. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we have as many feed forward as feed back um, coefficients. And uh, we can see that we get quite a nice um, magnitude response. It, it satisfies our, our requirements. Um, and I've added in this, this red line here to show a, a linear phase. And you can see that um, the, the phase of this Chebyshev <clears throat> filter stays linear, uh, but not all the way through the passband. So uh, about maybe, um, you know, we could say this, this is the end of the passband. So a little bit more than halfway through, it, it stays pretty linear, but then starts to deviate. So, you know, whether that's a significant issue for your particular application is something that um, you'd have to determine. And then over here, I'm showing the uh, pull zero plot using the z-plane command. Um, and uh, it's a pretty interesting uh, picture there. Uh, you can kind of see the strategy that Chebyshev uses to uh, achieve its design. Um, although you can't really make too many big insights into it, but again, you do see that it's placing the zeros over here. Um, well, we're only seeing one side of the frequency, so those zeros are accounting for, um, there's one, two, three, four zeros, and we see one, two, three, four um, very deep nulls. Um, in, in fact, those really go down to minus infinity, um, but that's you know, we're not really seeing that exactly on on the graph. Um, so it's that zero placement that's tacking things down and getting the stop band performance, and then this this kind of wall of poles here um, is precisely placed to give us this nice flat um, pass band. Uh, here's a design of the elliptical IIR uh, filter uh, using the command ellip. Uh, and again, uh, we can set different things. Now with this one, we can uh, we have the ability to set passband ripple. Uh, whoops, uh, <laughs> I've got a typo here. Uh, this should be stop band level. Stop band level. Uh, and we can set the passband edge. So here I set the passband edge to 0.5. Um, and here are the uh, coefficients that come out from that. Uh, and now I'm showing the uh, uh, magnitude and phase plots of that. And again, you can see that um, the um, for the same order, we're getting the same kind of phase response. It falls off from, from the linear. Uh, we get a, a remarkably flat uh, passband, uh, but that's largely because I asked for that. I asked for a 0.1 dB uh, ripple. Um, we see that we are uh, at least pretty close. It's hard to see because of the scale I used, uh, achieving the 60 dB. Uh, we're getting the, the passband edge of 0.5. Um, so everything that we we wanted, but unlike the the Chebyshev, for the same order, we're actually getting a uh, you know a better transition band here, um, but that's because up here I specified a 0.7 uh, transition band, um, so we can't really make a grand uh, assessment of that. Um, again, we see the use of zeros to tack things down, one, two, three, four. Um, and then we see a wall of poles, but in this case, they're uh, a little more pushed to the right, closer to the uh, unit circle. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of mathematics that goes into the design of these. Um, 
and the mathematics gives rise to the names of these things. Um, so we're not really going into that, but it, at least it gives you a, a little bit of a feeling. Uh, Butterworth, um, this has nothing to do with pancake syrup. Uh, again, a, a person's name who, um, who developed some mathematics and, and um, stuff for early uh, RLC circuit design name carries over because the mathematics kind of carries over. Um, here all we're allowed to do is ask for an order and a, and a passband edge. That's, that's all we're allowed to ask for. Um, and uh, so this, you see, does not get that wall of, of um, zeros around the unit circle, so we, we don't get that up and down kind of behavior. Um, but instead, um, you get a kind of a smooth roll off into the into the passband, um, and uh, these perhaps have uh, you know you might argue that they have a, a, a better phase response, although um, I don't know if that's consistent across the entire category or not. But um, you can play around with these and, and try out different designs and experiment with them. So just to uh, touch base with some things we've seen already, um, we'll we'll hammer this home. When we're looking at these pull zero diagrams, um, we should be able to, at least for simple ones, look at them and be able to visualize what the frequency response is going to look like. Um, so we've seen this before. Um, these poles here um, cause these um, high peaks. They go up to infinity. And as we um, you know go around this unit circle here, what we're really doing is tracing out this curve here is is traced out above us, um, and we can see the effect of of the poles here. So these poles are are what are responsible for pulling this thing up, and so we can see that uh, you know for this system that was at an angle of 0.3 pi minus 0.3 pi. Um, and you know, like we did before, we're we're thinking about just taking this as a cookie cutter out, and then you know we cut it here and we un we unwrap it and we get this, and you can see that those spikes, um, they're they're never perfectly, not necessarily perfectly at 0.3 pi, um, but actually as as the pole gets closer to the unit circle, they're actually closer to being right on the angle of the pole. As you move it back from the unit circle, um, it may shift slightly off from the angle, but it will certainly be close to that angle. So we've, we've been through this path before, but I wanted to point it out again because it's, it's an important thing for you to be able to do and visualize. Uh, and we've also seen this before, but I wanted to, to hit it again. Um, so, you know, we've seen before that um, when you have a, a pole um, in this position, it gives us th that kind of behavior. Um, and we've also seen that putting a zero at the origin, or a pole for that matter, at the origin does not change the magnitude. Um, so, you know, you that's a nice trick that you can, uh, but it does change the phase. So um, you can think about um, designing uh, to get a magnitude and then um, perhaps putting poles and zeros at the origin to try to change your phase to some degree. Um, now, uh, you know, as you've seen, we don't really design things by physically saying or explicitly saying, I'll put a pole there, I'll put a zero there. Um, but to understand how these different design procedures work or to quickly assess what a transfer function, a given transfer function might look like, um, these kinds of insights are, are very important. Um, here we're, we're, you know, we're placing a zero on the unit circle. We just saw that wall of, of uh, zeros right on the unit circle and we saw what they did. Um, so here that's uh, making that go down to zero. So um, these plots from zero to pi are, you know, we're starting at the angle angle zero here and working our way to pi. Um, so that's why the zero over in that um, at minus one on the z plane um, causes a um, um, th causes this behavior at omega equal to pi. Remember omega 
corresponds to the angle on um, of where you're standing on, on the unit circle. Uh, and then placing more poles or more zeros in, in a certain spot uh, kind of sharpens the, the behavior. So, um, you know, we saw this kind of structure uh, not quite as pronounced and not quite as close to the unit circle, but we saw that um, in uh, the elliptical design, I believe it was. Um, we saw something very similar to that as a way to create a very nice passband. Um, and the more zeros we put here, the, the um, lower the slope is that it comes in at, um, at pi. Um, so that gives us a better and better stop band. Now, also keep in mind that every time we add a pole or a zero, we're adding to the complexity of our, of our, uh, of our system. And uh, so, you know, it's kind of interesting uh, to, to play those things off against each other. Um, but, you know, it's the same thing in continuous time. To get a better filter, you need more R, L, and C components, and, and um, that raises the order of the differential equation. Um, same kind of thing, and with higher order differential equations, you can achieve better continuous time filters. So um, we've seen all this before, but I wanted to point it out again. Um, and, and this time I wanted to prove this effect of zero at the origin. Um, so suppose uh, we have some h of z and we multiply it by z that gives us an additional zero at the origin in the transfer function h1 of z. So now let's um, look at uh, the, trans or the frequency response. So everywhere there's a z we replace it by e to the j omega so the z out in front becomes an e to the j omega. Um, now we take the magnitude um, of H1, and so we get the magnitude of, of this whole thing here, uh, but the magnitude of a product is the product of their magnitudes, and um, the, um, the magnitude of this thing is equal to 1, so that goes away. So now we have that the, those two filters have the same magnitude, um, even though H1 has an additional zero at the origin. Uh, so that proves that the extra zero does not change um, the magnitude, but it does change the angle. Um, so we, we take the angle of the whole thing. Uh, so the angle of a product is the sum of the two individual angles. So we have the angle of h of omega plus the angle of this thing. Well, the angle of that is just omega. And so we can see that um, what the effect of an extra zero is, is that it adds a linear term of slope equal to one um, to, um, uh, to this, uh, to the, uh, the existing phase. So, um, so that's one thing that it does. So the, the effect of a zero, no effect on the magnitude, but it does affect the phase. Uh, same kind of thing with a pole at the zero. Uh, now we're going to put a z inverse there to get the extra pole at the origin. Uh, now we get an e to the minus j omega, but everything is the same. Uh, we get the magnitude of this, which is equal to 1, so we have the same behavior, uh, and, except now we're subtracting um, omega rather than, than adding omega. Um, okay, uh, we've talked about the effect of feedback. Um, if we have no feedback, the only place we can have poles is at the origin. So feedback allows us to have poles other than at the origin <clears throat> and raises the possibility that some of those poles could be outside the unit circle and therefore cause the system to be unstable. Um, and um, <laughs> can cause a system to be unsta <laughs> unstable, not, not stable. Um, okay, so uh, I should go and fix that in these notes. Um, so let's let's take a look at that. You know, here's a um, a trumped up difference equation where I've I've picked the coefficients here in a very special way. Um, and so um, looking at the the transfer function of that, uh, we can immediately go from the difference equation to this form. You should know how to do that. Um, almost off the top of your head by this point. Uh, and then we can convert to the, the z form, multiply top and bottom by z squared. Um, and so now we look at, at this form 
uh, that polynomial there, if you apply the quadratic form to that, you'll find out that it has roots, um, which since it's in the denominator gives us poles, um, at the position a e to the plus or minus j theta. So setting up these coefficients this way um, was done specifically to give us poles that um, by selecting a and theta we can we can put the poles anywhere we want. And so now we see that um, if we happen to set a larger than than one, um, then we would have a system that is unstable. Um, so um, again, as we try to design an IIR filter, if we have some sort of mathematical method to try to optimize that design, we have to build into that algorithm a way of checking to make sure that we haven't violated the stability um, of, the, uh, of the system. So looking at the effect of that A, um, as I get A closer to 1, um, notice that what's happening here is the pole moves closer and closer to, um, to the unit circle and the system becomes more and more un, uh, closer and closer to being unstable. Um, but what that does is we get more and more of a what's known as a resonant peak. So um, filters that have really high sharp peaks like that are filters that are really close to being um, unstable. Um, so um, it might be difficult to design one of those and then when you're uh, when you're implementing it you might be uh, uh, causing some sort of rounding uh, some numerical imprecision when you implement the, the coefficients uh, inside your computer with some finite arithmetic uh, and a design that you thought was stable but close to being unstable actually um, once you implement it in um, fixed point arithmetic um, might actually become unstable even though your theoretical um, infinite precision design says that it, that it is uh, stable. Uh, and then the other thing is that as we move, um, as we change the theta value, so as we as we move where the pole is, um, we we move where that spike is. Now, here's a curious thing, and I'm going to ask you why, and I'd ask uh, like you to think about this, and and we'll talk about it during class. Um, but notice that um, as we move the angle. Um, to um, higher higher values, the height of the peak actually actually changes, and I'm wondering if you can um, figure out why that might be. Um, so remember, there is a second um, peak involved here. There's um, so as we move this around the unit circle, uh, you know, for these for these large peaks, we we've got poles that are that are out here. Um, now also keep in mind that I've got a zero um, right there so this this particular system has a zero there as well um, you can you can see what um, what I've actually designed there um, and did we show that on the previous page yes so we've got a, a, a zero right there that's what accounts for that so um, no matter where I move the poles they are tagging that down now to explore this answer Try removing that zero and see what happens uh, for this one. Um, so um, anyway, think about that and see if you can um, come up with an answer for that. Um, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.